Hi everyone, uh, it's me, and I know you haven't heard from me in a long time. Uh, honestly, I just really haven't had many things to talk about, I know, stunning. But I wanted to come back this time with hopefully better audio. I did get one of those funny looking pop filters that everyone puts over their mics. So, uh, hopefully I'll be more tolerable. If not, can't really help you. But, nevertheless, uh, today I decided to do something a bit different, and I'm going to read passages from a, a notebook that I had written in. And I haven't written in this notebook in a while, and I didn't date the stuff. I'm going to go ahead and assume this is probably from around two years ago. But... In all honesty, I can't be too sure. Could be two, could be three years ago. Um, and it's not to say that this is like embarrassing content. I don't think it is. I think it's actually pretty good. But you'll notice that some of this is pretty edgy. Uh, and not, I don't think I was trying to be edgy. Actually, my, you know, my, my prose is pretty good here for just being written in a, a you know, a cottage core looking notebook here, but uh, I thought it would be enlightening and maybe a little interesting just to read back uh, this because I found it randomly. So little treasure trove, little gem that I just randomly found. So I titled some of the sections. I think I, I think there's like six of them or something to that effect. I'll read you the titles and then I'll continue on with them. This is probably not going to be that long of an episode. Maybe I'll give a little commentary after each of them, but let's see where this takes us. So the first fragment I have here um, is entitled Class, Class Interest, and Classism. Classes are constantly kept in competition with one another in order to create an antagonism that distracts from bourgeois manipulation. This can be between races or intraracial, meaning between those of the same race. Immigrants who share working class interests are often blamed for unemployment. This is false, as the capitalists must always have a rescue and reserve army of workers to put pressure on existing workers. Outsourcing and offshoring are symptoms of wage labor, slavery, and manipulation. The Global South is unfairly exploited in this regard. Right-wingers will always vote against their own class interests to kneecap other working class individuals. Liberals have also failed to properly address working class interests by constantly propping up the very same big businesses that enforce class separatism and wage slavery. As the wealth gap widens, burgeoning inequality will force the middle class to either identify with the poor or to continue to ridicule them. The proles are oppressed by the state apparatus, which institutionalizes power and removes the true democratic process from the people, which further antagonizes the proles, including lumpen proles. Please forgive, like, the LARPy speech here. I'm sure I was trying to be very, you know, um, <laughs> very uh, high-minded and controversial, but uh, it is what it is. Intersectional oppression, including class, unites all against those who perpetrate injustice. And that's the end of that section. So, um, I think, uh, I think Fina from two or three years ago was spitting facts as the kids say speaking truth to power um i don't have much to say about this one other than um excuse the larpiness but other than that it's pretty on point uh it's true you know you'll always see those comics floating around where it's like the the boss taking the cookies from the um, like the poor person or whatever, or the worker, and then like pointing to this person who clearly looks like they have nothing and probably sleep in a grass hut, and are like, well, be careful, he's gonna take your cookies from you. It's that sort of uh, ethos 
And it's true. Uh, I think the part that really struck me was that, yeah, there's this, like, liberal, even social democrat um, incentive, I guess you could say, to just straight up ignore some people that are otherwise not attached to your class or your class's interests and just say, well, I mean, some people have to die so that we may all live. Uh, you know, that is a sacrifice I'm willing to make, that one meme. So I don't like how that seems to happen even amongst some progressives. They're like, yeah, you know, some people just, some people with blue hair and pronouns just have to die. <laughs> it's the price we pay and we know that's garbage, but of course some people uh, just are just thinking survival of the fittest mindset. So yeah, that one was, that was that. Next one we have is uh, capitalism and pinkwashing, and perhaps I should have read this in June, but y you know how it'd be. All right. Uh, capitalism constantly tries to persuade LGBT youth that they are queer friendly. I guess that was supposed to be capitalist, actually. Let me rephrase that. Capitalists constantly try to persuade LGBT youth that they are queer friendly by using commodity fetishism. I am using um, the Q word here. If that makes you uncomfortable, just note that I don't use it very much, but I guess I was feeling uh, spicy today, and I know a lot of um, young LGBTQAI plus people do use it. However, the spectacle of using rainbow colors and language that is queer positive is only a bruise to sell products to an already marginalized group. Idpol can create a spectacle. Companies capitalize on June as Pride Month and then immediately rescind all forms of public support. It is a predatory relationship. Often, companies like Chick-fil-A will go Pride for June and then continue to donate to homophobic charities. Libs often praise this acceptance and rep, but they miss the economic and sociocultural subtext and context. This one I think is a little more interesting because I am talking about spectacle, and I, I like to talk about spectacle. And id poll, by the way, I just want to make it clear I'm not one of those people that's on stupid poll and is like, I hate all people that. <laughs> participate in identity politics because they are uh, dumb poopy heads. I don't think that I am pretty ambivalent on id poll. I never really felt very strongly about it except probably when I was 16 and stupid. But of course, every 16 year old that has access to our Tumblr in action is stupid. So uh, yeah, but it's true, um, you know, pinkwashing is real, spectacle be fetishized, um, and you gotta, but see, that's the thing, a lot of, like, young LGBT people are just like, yeah, we see through you, take it somewhere else, so good on them. And another thing about Chick-fil-A, they still haven't turned themselves around. I don't think they ever would because their power base is fundies. And we know how fundies be. So that's not, um, I, I don't know. I think maybe I was being a little hard on the libs here. I think a lot of them are starting to realize the effects of pink washing. Uh, perhaps I was just trying to rail against the normies here. But, yeah, some of them do miss the sociocultural context of what they're trying to criticize. I sound very crit theory professor here. Uh, nonetheless, this one, this one is very edgy. This one's very edgy. This next one, this one isn't titled either, but um, it says, We're going to be sacrificed to the line i.e., you know, line go up, line go down, the stock market line, I guess you could say. I just call it the line. By bloodthirsty pigs and landlords who live on our pittances. I hope May Day, i.e. Labor Day, but it's May 1st for a lot of people, can bring about an acceleration to this material reality crisis we're faced with. 
unrelated, but why do medical professionals conflate sex and gender? This still confuses me. I don't understand why they do. Urethral length and risk of UTI is sex-based, not gender determined. <laughs> um, I don't know if I should read the next line because it might get me um, banned, but uh, I'll just summarize it as uh, ACAB and uh, what do they call that? Like unlife or <laughs> unlife all landlords. There you go. Um, but yeah, so there's that. Uh, this is very edgy, but it's very true. I don't know why people seem to be obsessed with the line, and I don't use that word lightly. You'll see that I never use the phrase obsessed or obsession or what not, because I think people overuse that word to the extreme. But in this case, it's like Hunter S. Thompson when he talked about politics. It's people who are really into money, making money, moving it around, and trying to make their money generate money are... Like, that's what they do. That's all they do. That That's their life. It's like people who are super into politics. That's their one thing. And it becomes like heroin addiction, where you just have to, like, do it all the time, make it your day job, and <laughs> that's basically what you are known for. That's what you're about. That's who all your friends know you for. It's, <laughs> it's a real terminal condition, but... Yeah, uh, landlord's still bad. But yeah, um, material reality crisis. Uh, yeah, very, very dialectical materialism of me. But it's all true. I'm still annoyed by the whole sex and gender thing. And I'm not trying to be like bioessentialist. I'm just trying to say that I, I feel like medical professionals are trying their best but people who make the textbooks are often like you know the they describe risk of utis and they're like if someone has a female gender and then it's like but if but it's it's less i'm trying to explain this maybe i should use something a little more like physical but like i said urethra length it's just it's going to depend on your your physicality, um, not your, not how well you pass socially, not who, whom you have transitioned to, what gender, or if you're non-binary, because people don't know what non-binary even means, but it's just, I don't know why they do that. It, it kind of reminds me of people who say females or males and be weird about it. I don't know. I, I've, I never even said that when I was a kid because I think describing someone socially by their I don't know I guess by their physicality or their genitals is just strange and I, I, I kind of uncouth if I could use the right word but yeah so they just I don't know medical professionals weird sometimes but they're trying I guess uh, I also wrote Good Night White Pride. That still sticks. That's still valid. Um, to sound like a, a Twitterite, it's valid. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> um, there's a little smiley face next to that one, so you know I was happy about it. Uh, we have some Death Grips lyrics here. I guess I really was feeling very enthusiastic. This is a very... Uh, I don't know if I would call it self-pitying, but it's, like, very feelsy when I wrote this. I think all anarchists have been hurt before. That's why they and or we have sympathy for the weak. Makes sense. Very true. Generally, if you've been hurt before, you'll have more empathy for those who are going through it. As I'm told. Is the truth, psychologically. Not that I've never experienced empathy, trust me. I have. <laughs> Too much of it. Next thing is me just doing Death Grips lyrics where I say, make you want to break in the Apple store. Good song. <laughs> Hacker's a good song. Uh, 
Okay, this one's controversial, so uh, put on your controversy hat here. Uh, no wonder AMCAPs have the Gazden flag as their main flag. That's what they are. Snakes. <laughs> then I wrote more Death Crips lyrics. I don't know what I was doing. I think I was a little schizophrenic this day. Um, it's true, though. I don't know... I guess it's just because I think it's almost impossible at this point. Like, if you were in, like, 1920, I could see if you were an ANCAP. You, I don't think ANCAP, I don't know if ANCAPs existed in 1920. Maybe they did. I don't know when Hayek lived and Mises. I don't know. But I think you could have been an ANCAP back then and you would have had some room to stand on. You know, some room to breathe, a leg to stand on, etc. But... Nowadays, I find it almost fundamentally contrary with material reality to think that you could be an ANCAP. Because, first of all, the history of anarchism is not capitalist. I'm just, I don't know what to tell you. It's just not. But even if you're, you know, if, even if you're a breakaway of that and you're a little different, it's... It's really evident to see that capitalism has failed. And even if you're not into uh, socialism, Marxism, etc., you have to at least acknowledge that capitalism's kind of on its way out. It's just not, it's not working. It's not working. It, I don't think capitalism has worked um, since the Great Depression. <laughs> uh, and even after that, uh, not after that, and even before that, it, it was kind of eh, but it, from the Industrial Revolution around the time mercantilism kicked the bucket and capitalism kind of took over, I think you could have made the argument from, like, Industrial Revolution around the time to the Great Depression, the beginning of it. Capitalism was at least doing okay. It was doing fine. I don't think it was ever fair. But um, I don't know if we can find an economic system that's completely fair. We can find ones that are definitely better than this. But, so I just don't know if it's possible to be an ANCAP in good faith. It seems that a person who is an anarcho-capitalist would betray their own sense of uh, duty to the human race by keeping us in those chains of this person is your is your boss and gets to set how much you make arbitrarily and then take money from you just because they want to you know and they can argue well you're working for them it's kind of symbiotic but at the same time like you're not going to tell your boss okay well now you make less money and give me your money <laughs> it's it's not you know you're you're kind of a slave man <laughs> you kind of a slave, man. I just realized how uh, hippie I sounded there. But nevertheless, I just think that to be an ANCAP, you kind of have to be a bit of a sellout. Uh, we have triple six five four ton tachyon. Okay. So this next one is actually a really good one when I was reading it back, and this one's called Community Atomization. Fash, i.e. fascist, sometimes I don't finish words. Prey on those who are lonely, angry, weak, paranoid, and disaffected. Community atomization has, called, has caused enemy and led to cultural groups and class groups destruction. Sorry, I, I got a swallow there. Capitalism is a disease. Isolation and alienation are the symptoms. We are not mentally ill. We are being submerged into endless work culture that crushes our desires and isolates us from camaraderie. I don't actually know if this part is supposed to be included. I don't 
think it is I'm gonna just save that one for another time but yeah community atomization is a real thing and this is actually something fascists use to um, propagate their propagate the general will uh, propagate their message that you know the nuclear family is falling apart what do we do well we got to go back to 1540 you know we got to only have the white people and if you are there if you if you are in a same-sex relationship I mean <laughs> you just gotta die he's gotta die you gotta go live on the island somewhere can't reproduce well you can't reproduce anyway but you know what I'm saying uh, if you are a POC good luck trying to reproduce good luck trying to leave your house <laughs> But the point I'm trying to make here is that community animization is probably one of the biggest issues plaguing this world because people don't feel connected to people in their community or even outside of their community. And it's making it harder for us to actually empathize and take action towards things we want because we just don't have any faith that anybody around us cares enough to do anything. There's a lot of apathy, and it's really sad because apathy is perhaps the most dulling of feelings, of emotions. Uh, it's it's just very discouraging to be apathetic. You know, if you're pissed off, you can go, like, I don't know, be like the guy who punched Richard Spencer. Uh, but, you know, if you are apathetic, I don't know if you fall into nihilism you just end up being depressed and saying well guess this is just how it works <laughs> which it's not it's not just how it works you can you can change things and it's really sad seeing people isolated and alienated because they have to just go to work they can't and this is another argument people say against this well go set your own hours go be your own boss no, not going to work like that. Not everybody can do that, and not everybody is meant to be their own boss. Being your own boss is very difficult, and if you don't have a, you know, a grant from Warren Buffett or your rich wasp uncle, then it's probably not going to happen. Or if it does, I don't mean to sound super defeatist, it's hard to maintain it. Yeah. Spiritual paranoia is real. Hmm. Sounds like a good name for a song or a band. Next one. Hyper-specific cliques where everyone thinks they can justify their agendas because they are, to, to quote um, uh, Mike Duncan, I think that's his name, from the Revolutions podcast, the true representative of the general will. I wrote in all caps. Said during a Frev podcast, that's every lefty org, we really did inherit the spirit. And we did, I suppose. I think this is for everybody, but I think, I don't know, I guess I could say that every lefty org is really egotistical and, and very self-involved. And they think that they are the true inheritors of the general will, the bearers of the, of the freedom torch. But... They're not, not, not everybody can, first of all, don't be so self-involved if you're going to be in a, if you're going to be a political activist, you have to be the opposite of self-involved to be a political activist or, you know. So, yeah, during a FREV podcast, by the way, I say FREV, it's French Revolution. I just, again, abbreviated because I used to spend a lot of time on the FREV Tumblr tag back in the day and we did inherit the spirit and I think that's a good thing I think it's good to be spunky and I think past me had a good point where everybody seems to think that they need to form a hyper specific clique just because they think they're the owners of the general will this is the thing that happens all the time though like I was reading Tom Wolfe's from Bau can't say words I think it's pronounced Bauhaus or bar house um to our house and it's his history on how architecture got gross and boring and too uniform to be interesting to anybody except super boring people 
And that is literally what happened. They formed hyper-specific cliques and everybody made their own manifesto doctrine and said this is our movement and this is how we do things and it's only slightly different from the person next door. So this one is just, again, me being edgy. I wonder if ANCAPs, I, I guess I like to complain about them a lot because they were like my antithesis and they were very annoying can ever be radicalized. I think so, but I like to make fun of them too much. Smiley face. Run the jewels can stay after the revolution. Again, me talking about the revolution, being very LARP, being very edgy. Um, and eh, whatever. It's an incentivizer, I guess, for some people. So, I don't know. I... <laughs> So, not going to sound Trotsky is here, but I don't think there's going to be just one capital R revolution. It's very rare that that would actually happen. Honestly, Trotsky had a good point there. Not, not you know, permanent revolution. I guess the revolution is always happening, but at the same time, it makes more sense that there would be several of them happening at the same time. You know, like, like the Arab and the Prague Spring, I guess. So, ANCAPs can have, absolutely, anybody can. Anybody can become more unselfish. I think that's the main problem with ANCAPs, is that they are very selfish. And I, I talked about this in a, in a blog post I made, and I, it, it's called Wearing Your Heart on Your Sleeve. It's on my WordPress. But I think there is this idea that ANCAPs and, like, similar ilk of that nature... They seem to think in very negativistic terms in which they can only say don't do X, Y, Z. And then when they try to say do X, Y, Z, they run into roadblocks because it's like, well, if, you know, this might be tyrannous and God forbid I be, you know, tyrannous to stand up for what I believe in. Um, especially if it's progressive, but I, I don't know. I think it's a lot of... I think it's I think it's paralysis. I think it's a lot of um, paralysis and moral hand wringing sometimes. But sometimes they just go off and are like, "I don't care. I'm I'm winning. <laughs> I'm hashtag winning." So get to the back, haters. No, you know, no, no regulations. We're going all in on this bee. I do like to make fun of them. Not as much as I used to. I don't like to make fun of anybody, really. But a, a little bit of fun. Uh, Run the Jewels. Very good. Love Run the Jewels. Shout out. I also ended this one with... I don't know how to say it. Yen? Which is French for nothing. You know, like what Louis wrote in his notebook or his journal after he came back from hunting the day that the Bastille was stormed. Okay, this one is... Uh, I don't think I identify with this anymore, but we're gonna just say it. We have a lot to learn about the Chaz. The Chaz. I sound like a 70-year-old grandmother saying, Billy, can you help me get onto the Facebook? Anyway, I take inspiration and watch with bated breath. Can they stay afloat despite police presence? I hope. Uh, they didn't. Spoiler alert, they did not. They weren't very well organized. I think they were only allowed to be there because <laughs> of the goodwill of their, their district. Also, there was that guy who became a warlord and then he became the leader and messed a lot of stuff up and made it generally really unsafe to be there, but I wonder how he's doing. I wonder if he's still alive. I think he tried to push his mixtape. Good for him. Uh, stay winning, King. I suppose. But yeah, I don't really... I think I liked Chaz for about a day, and then I saw that they were pretty mismanaged, and I said, alright, we're gonna have to try again. And, you know, it's a step forward. Learning. Life lesson. Okay, next. So this one's titled, What Keeps Us Complacent? So I have a list here. One, being tired. Two, apathy. I was talking about that before. 
Three, nihilism. Four, comfort and routine. Five, fear. And six, unhealthy body, mind, and spirit. So capitalism stifles spirituality, true spirituality. So I I list a bunch of uh, different spiritual practices here. And I say that they are all commodified by capitalism to keep people invested in shallow, skin-deep, curtailed personality analysis. Life is too busy, and there are too many ads and social norms to make fun of us with. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is like a... This is like a whole... This is a whole thing. Uh, spirituality and religion are co-opted for keeping people either complacent or buying or to like to buy stuff. Um, real spiritual awareness is internal and no tools are really necessary. Um, sometimes we are subject to confirmation bias. We have to unlock our higher thinking naturally and not boil spirituality down to something you post on Twitter for good vibes. You have to just use your body. The point of spirituality is satisfaction, not moralism, and predicting and reinforcing your bias in a group sharing of labels. So this one's very, um, hot take, I suppose. I don't really agree with all of this anymore. I think I was very cynical at this point. Uh, I do still agree with some of this. I think a lot of times people, um... People sometimes get trapped in this cycle of I need to be better, I need to constantly heal, I need to be the best me possible, and this just, it reminds me of Alan Resnick's, um, what is it, living exactly as you are now, where he's the hot young tech wizard, and he's showing off that biotechnology that'll make you the best you possible, (laughs) that's literally oh it no it's living forever as you are now got it and that's a great one love alan rosnick but it's it's true in a way um yeah capitalism loves when you're just tired and you're just sitting in front of the tv and wondering what happened you know letting the days go by (laughs) i'm tired type stuff but this is not this see this is one of those things where this is not only capitalism this is other things i'm not going to solely blame capitalism for making us be apathetic tired nihilistic too comfortable fearful and unhealthy because that is not just capitalism's fault that's everything um can cause that for example uh climate change can cause that um abuse can cause that in any form um feeling unfulfilled uh you know a dream deferred i if i could use langston hughes's words Um, honestly, just feeling like you can't do what you want right now is another thing that leads to this, uh, feeling hopeless. A lot of stuff can lead to this depression, (laughs) anxiety, etc. I think the real crux here is, uh, fear leads to a lot of this stuff. But, I think I go a little too hard in the paint here. But people do get commodified by shallow, skin-deep, curtailed personality analysis. I'm not immune to that. I do like to indulge in it from time to time. It's just fun and my monkey brain likes it. But at the same time, there are too many ads and social norms that literally just exist to make fun of us. Like sometimes your MBTI or your numerological profile just exist to, to make fun of you. And I know that sounds controversial, but a lot of times it's it's just a lot <laughs> to take in and it feels like you're being sold sometimes, like you're being sold down the river. Um, I say that real spirituality is internal and I agree with that, but I think you can also garner spiritual this is very sound bitey i understand most of these are fragments and they're very sound bitey so they're not meant to be expanded upon but uh, i just want to say i'm not knocking on people who use spiritual tools here i was because i think i was a little frustrated and i was in a mode where i was very um i guess you could say 
I only, you know, I, I, I believe only in what I see, which is weird for me. I don't know. I was probably having an off day here, but, um, you can garner spiritual uh, enlightenment from internal and external forces. You just gotta be, you gotta be careful. Uh, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a real thing. Um, I think it's, I think it lessens if you can cultivate um, what they call discernment. In which case then you can be like, yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not looking at this the right way or I need to come back or I need a second opinion or something like that. Um, yeah, no, I do not like people who just post their whatever on Twitter for good vibes with like one sentence, quippy, sound bitey, sassy lines because I think it's really grating on the nerves. So I think if you're gonna do true spirituality, you need to actually, I don't wanna sound like one of those no true Scotsmen gatekeepers, but you, you gotta kinda keep it more so, you can't make a business out of it. I don't think you should make a business out of it. Same thing like, I don't think faith healers should make a business out of it. <laughs> I just don't think it's something that needs to be commodified. It doesn't need to be monetized. Yeah. But it, the point of spirituality in my mind is satisfaction. No labels, no moralism. Here's a very uh, philosophical one. At least... Yeah, the first line seems pretty philosophical. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Live well. Oh, this is actually uh, separate from this next section, but I guess I'll include them together. This next one is titled On Hospital Nursing. Hospital nursing is polluted and perverted. That's some pretty strong language. <laughs> Past Vina. U.S. healthcare is not so nice word. <laughs> U.S. Uh, no person with a clear conscience can say otherwise. Insurance does little to nothing. People of color and migrants are given dirt locked in cages like animals. We spend more than 10 times on the Department of Defense budget than the healthcare and human services budget. For-profit services are the devil. Non-for-profits are usually just as evil when their fees are high. Public health is the only option to morally break free of the chains of medical debt for the working nurse. Preventative care, underserved populations, policy changes, testing, immunizations, epidemiology are all the better. End-of-life care can be a bloodletting process. I don't have much to say about this other than um, go off, but yeah, I've had this screed against insurance working around in my brain for a pretty long time. I don't agree that hospital nursing is polluted and perverted, but I, I do think that it's really overburdened, I should say, and everybody would agree with that. That's a pretty milk toast opinion, but... Um, yeah, U.S. healthcare has been dead, deader than a doornail for many years. And it's, it, that's a real fact. We do spend 10 times on the Department of Defense budget compared to the HHS budget. I don't also want to rail against non-for-profits. I know the non-profit industrial complex is a thing, but... I think nonprofits really do a lot of good work, and I don't want to discount their work, especially because I do want to um, work for a nonprofit one day, but they're not exempt from the cruelty that's inherent in all profitable services. This next one is called COVID Realism. And this is not some like COVID denier. You know, Anthony Fauci put ogre blood in <laughs> the vaccines. I promise. Uh, the health crisis and COVID have taught many to hold their masters accountable. Some still languish. They are too world-weary or selfish. It can't happen here. It has, is, and will. 
And this is a continuation of COVID realism. Also, nice, it can't happen here reference, Fina. That was a great, great book. I loved it. Honestly, lots of nice lessons for people. I think everybody should read that book. So this is COVID realism riot edition, because I guess I was mad. I was, I was, I was feeling it tachyon. <laughs> okay. Watch as the racism swells forth. For the ignorant, copaganda is working like a charm. Protesters who go too far aren't welcome. Libs hate what people do to make progress. They must be in a, a candlelit vigil or they get trashed in the media. Conservatives get mad and say slurs. This is the real degeneration, they say. But what nobody knows that I know, you know, because obviously I'm smarter than every other person in this 8 billion peopled world, <laughs> this population of 8 billion, uh, is that the culture war, which is a dirty war, very messy, will be won through all the Doremus Jessops of the world, the just only assassins for the need. Thank you, Camus and Lewis. <laughs> Some references there to uh, the just by Camus, which is about um, some assassins trying to uh, kill, who is it? I don't remember. I think it's a Russian ruler. I think it's a Russian leader. And their whole, uh, it's a play and their whole plot. It's good. And Doremus Jessup, of course, the protagonist of It Can't Happen Here by Sinclair Lewis. Yeah, but that's so true. Like, I don't know why people on TV see, like, a candlelit vigil and this is, like, the only form of acceptable protest to them. I, It's like they saw people back in the day protesting for rights and was like, yeah, it was okay back then, but we're fine now. We're all complacent and everything is fine and dandy here and we don't need anything else. When it's really much more um, unbalanced and insidious. Copaganda always works like a charm during COVID. People see cops being, you know, pushing people down or being brutal, harassing people, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's just, mm -mm. no, no, no. Which, I mean, COVID brought to the forefront the reality of disaster capitalism for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, the real degeneration is that I have to wear a mask. Isn't that funny? And to end it all off, here's a, a very little fragment from something I suppose I was trying to finish, but I never did. Sometimes circumstances make me evil. I acknowledge this and will do my best to implement a best practice for it. Kind of cheeky, they're kind of sarcastic. But it's true, sometimes circumstances make us evil. I don't think we should be complacent in that evil, but we should strive to be better for it. And then I just wrote the phrase, crack house arrest. Uh, someone was watching a little too much Chapo. Nevertheless, that is the end. This was way longer than I thought it would be. I waffled yet again, as usual. But uh, I'll say goodbye here. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I uh, will see you around. Bye-bye.